today, we have Nick Wilson from Gearbox, and I will let him do all the exposition about where he's from, what he's done, and all of those things. So, a warm welcome for Nick Wilson. How's it going, everybody? How are you doing today? Uh, I'll try not to read directly off my PowerPoint. I'll just use the script that I put on my phone instead. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, hi, people. Uh, I'm Nick Wilson, as you know. I uh, do effects at Gearbox Software. And uh, I've got to start with the usual boring industry disclaimer. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about a bunch of stuff. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about getting a job in the video game industry. I'm going to talk to you about what it's like when you actually get there, and a little bit on how to conduct yourself to be successful when you do arrive. Uh, at the end, I'm going to give everybody a bunch of business cards so you can contact me after I leave. Uh, that's important to me because I don't want you to feel that if somebody talks over you for the rest of the presentation, you can't ask any questions, that I escaped your life and you can never ask me anything. I don't think that would be very cool. I know if I was in your spot, I would probably cry myself to sleep that night. <laughs> so, uh, that being said, there are also questions that I can't answer, and you're an intelligent group of young people, I'm sure you can figure out what those questions are going to be, like, you know, what happens in the future, that sort of stuff. Uh, so yeah, basically, I'll let you know. And then, don't, don't be afraid to ask questions, but if I'm just like, oh, sorry, I can't answer that, don't, like, shoot your hand up and ask me a follow-up to the question I can't answer or something like that. Okay. So, stuff about me. Uh, I've got more than uh, five years on the RTM at Gearbox, which is pretty cool. It's a good place to work. I've had fun doing it. Uh, when I started off, I actually got brought into the uh, art outsourcing pipeline. And uh, that was way back in 2008 I was doing that. I was actually an intern for about a year. And uh, there's a lot of art outsourcing that goes on. I don't know if you guys are aware of that whole thing. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. Uh, <laughs> a lot of companies pay third-party companies to bring art in. And so I, I was kind of in charge of like, making sure everything was up to snuff. We could put it in the game. Uh, when I started on Borderlands 1, <coughs> Uh, it was like January 2009, so not too long uh, before the game actually shit. Uh, it was at that point that I started moving into more of a uh, technical artist and visual effects artist role. And just from the conversations I've had with people here uh, today already, I, I can tell that the definition that, that you guys have of technical artist, I think, tends to skew more toward animation. Is that true? No, everyone's shaking their head. Yeah, the technical artist, uh, at least as defined by Gearbox, tends to married very closely to visual effects artists. That means you do particle effects, shaders, all that kind of stuff. All right. So what do I do every day? I gotta make that stuff. That's pretty important. You know, you got Mr. Torg always talking about explosions in his Randy Savage voice, and I'm one of the guys that makes them. We have a team of about eight people, but uh, it's just continually pumping out uh, particle effects. We made over 2,000 just for Borderlands 2. It's kind of ridiculous. It was fun, but man, a lot of work. Okay. All right, so yeah, the, the assignments that we do, uh, they vary really greatly. Uh, maybe one day it's a muzzle flash, another could be adding some fog to a level. Anything that adds movement to a scene and creates ambience. Uh, this can get really complicated really quickly. Uh, basically, I'm usually looking at a list of like 20 or so assets that I need to create at any given time. Uh, visual effects has a much quicker turnaround time than something like character art or 3D animation as well. So it, it's not uncommon for a designer to come to somebody like me and be like, you know, we, we got this new gun, shoots ice or whatever. And whereas uh, a 3D modeler had time to model that gun for three weeks, I might, I might have to finish my work in like two days. Uh, yeah, and hopefully when, when we're getting stuff done quickly enough, that we have time to go back and uh, polish. On Borderlands 2, we definitely did. Uh, I don't know, did any of you guys play Borderlands 2? Yes. Okay. Wow, that's a lot of hints. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, the game's done really well for itself, obviously. That's uh, 
it's been a game changer for me because I, I, I came into this, this company not sure what was going to happen. We got a, a bunch of projects that didn't seem to uh, have a clear direction. And between January 2009 and uh, I believe it was October 20th, 2009, when we shipped Borderlands 1, suddenly it's like the entire face of the company has changed. We've got, we've got this awesome hit brand that everybody's really excited about. I just like signed stuff for people before we even got started here. It's crazy. I'm not, I'm not used to that. People come to the community, they would give them like a t-shirt, you know, a hat. They're like, oh, we just signed this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I never know how to react to that. Thank you. All right. So other stuff that I do all day, um, I have to interface with the code to improve the editor. Uh, I'm not sure how much time you guys have really spent in the Unreal development kit, but uh, base implementation for a lot of stuff in Unreal is perfect as long as you're making Gears of War. And any time that you want to expand upon that, it requires a lot of programmers. And I, I know this is a good place to be because actually I, I want to take a poll. This is important. How many programmers do we have in here? That's a pretty good group. So, so who, who's on like the production track? Oh, OK, well, we've got a lot there. And, and so I assume the rest are artists, or do we all kind of go? Not as confident. Yeah, you're artists. OK. <laughs> 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 That's good. Uh, other things that are important, uh, the post-process chain, anything has to do with like depth of field, bloom, uh, motion blur, that kind of stuff. That's stuff that, that we're charged with, that, that we have to look at uh, in the effects department. The effects department at Gearbox has like eight guys, uh, eight different content uh, creator uh, people. Uh, I am one of the longest standing members on the team. Uh, right, right when I got hired, it, my boss, Prior to that point was a, a guy, Jim Sanders, awesome artist. He'd spent, uh, I think, 12 years at Midway. And uh, he was the only person making particle effects at Gearbox up until I came on. It, it was just one of those things where he's like, he's like, yeah, you think you could do this? And I'm like, I don't know, man. I did some like lightsaber videos when I was 15. <laughs> Maybe I'll try that out. And uh, the first thing I worked on is actually the, uh, the fire skag in Portland one. So. It gives you kind of frame of reference of my starting point. Uh, uh, it's also important that I work with animation, audio design, uh, other departments to improve the feedback loop. Just stuff like hit feedback when you're shooting at somebody, blood splashes, you know, metal impacts, all, all that kind of stuff. It, it's one of those things that as we go into a project, we know we're going to have to work on that stuff. And it's pretty cut and dry. And uh, speaking of dry. Uh, <laughs> uh, that being said, it's like it, it's so necessary to, to making any game feel uh, right, you know, because all, all we work on basically is first person shooters, so that comes up a lot. Stuff about me. Uh, <laughs> favorite game of all time is Super Metroid. This is important. <laughs> that was smart ass comments. <laughs> Super Metroid, greatest game of all time. I don't think that's necessarily up for debate. One of the <laughs> most technically solid video games you'll ever play. I guess it doesn't have multiplayer or something. There's no achievements, I'm sorry. <laughs> Favorite Mega Man is Mega Man 3. I really enjoyed Mega Man 2. I think the music is a little overpopular. <laughs> that being said, Spread of the Robot Masters Mega Man 3 is pretty great. So, anyway. <coughs> on my industry philosophy a bit here. Uh, how many of you guys have been to like PAX, or <coughs> stuff like that? Have you guys been to any of those shows, really? It's a smattering of people. OK. That's coming up again later, so keep that in mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, one thing that I hate any time that we, we do like the Gearbox Community Day, uh, E3, maybe not so much E3, more, more like uh, PAX, some of that just like anybody can go, they buy a ticket to show for these things. Uh, the reactions that you get from a lot of people when they're talking to the, the want to break into the industry, it's it's the same speech every time. And I don't know if they realize that they're doing it to people, but they come in and they're like, hey man, like, you know, I love video games, and the thing is, like, I've never, just hear me out for a second, uh, I, <laughs> I'm more of an idea guy, uh, and no. Okay, I'm sorry. Like, before they even get a chance to get into that speech, it's like, I have tuned out already. 
It's like, everybody's an idea man. If, if you think for a second that we have people that are sitting in the audio department that just don't care about video games and they, they sit playing with a little like cheap Yamaha keyboard or something and they're just like, hey, all of a sudden, it's like, there's a game that features all my great music. Like, no, everybody's paying attention to the game at any point in time. I, I think you guys in, in this school probably have a greater understanding of that than a lot of the programs I've, I've seen across the country because you're, you're working very closely together with each other. You're like actually put in a team to work on games. I think that's really cool. I could have used that. That would have been useful. You know, whatever. Texas, right? Uh, <laughs> so, all I'm getting at is, when you, when you meet that person, just be clear that like everybody's an idea, man. Don't let anybody get this idea that they're just like they're gonna go into a company, like they're gonna come into Gearbox or something, and just be like, I've got this idea for a game. It's really cool. It's like it's usually a sequel to something, or it's gonna be an idea that already exists. They just haven't played that game. <laughs> they're, they're like, there's a, there's a million bazillion guns and a talking yellow robot that dances. <laughs> and like, I think it's going to be revolutionary, man. So the question that I have for people always is, uh, you know, do you want to be a game developer? Do you want to be an artist? Are, are you a master of your craft? What, what's important to you in the game development space? But at your core, are you a game developer? Or do you just sit there and make art all day? Not that there's anything wrong with that, because there's not. But. All right, how to get into games. This is a question on everybody's mind. I, I think if you're anything like me when you're in college, you, you don't make the assumption that as soon as you leave that there's just a job waiting on you. You read the news. You know that these companies lay off people all the time. The industry can be a really ugly place. Uh, that being said, What's some of the stuff you need to do to make sure that you get noticed? I don't like that little picture that gets cut. <laughs> so, uh, getting into the industry, I think, uh, commonly, something, a mistake I see people make all the time is uh, you'll, you'll meet somebody at, at a trade show, you'll meet them at a school introduce themselves, tell you a bit about what they do. And uh, a week later, you're going to get like an email. And it, it, you, you might just be CC'd on it. It might go directly to HR or whatever. And uh, when they don't get a reply within like 24 hours, they just send another email. And they're like, hey, don't forget about me. My name's like, I don't know, we're just going to use the name Brandon. My name's Brandon. And uh, we met at that school that Nick isn't going to mention. And, uh, you know, like, they, they want to hear back because they're like, well, I met you, you see me face to face, now you obviously can't lose me. Time for me to get a job at your company. It's like, dude, no one wants to hire that guy, okay? Like, and, and this happens all the time. You would think that adults are also professionals. That's not necessarily true uh, in all cases. Um, another thing is people talk about, like, who you know, and I think that's kind of ridiculous, too. Um, on the little blurb about me coming here, uh, there, there's a mention of how I used to work for a small startup called uh, Game Bunker. Now, if I were to come in here and tell you, yeah, well, because I worked at Game Bunker, I knew all these people, I would be listing people like uh, Ken Levine from like Bioshock and stuff. Like, I, yeah, I interviewed the guy. I don't know him. He doesn't know who the hell I am. So it, it, it's not a good idea to just start like name dropping people either. Now, what is important is that you take that relationship to the next step and you get to actually know these people. Because uh, if someone will vouch for you, that's key to you getting a job. Uh, when we meet somebody at a school, they've got their portfolio on a tablet, and they're like, hey, man, can you just give me like 30 seconds? They show me some uh, like visual effects that they made. Now I'm paying attention. Even if you know the content was just like kind of middling, it wasn't necessarily like awesome, Like that's exactly the right thing. When you show me what you've done, that's super interesting to me. It gets forwarded to my boss. It'll probably get forwarded on to human resources. And you, you got a foot in the door that way. Uh, the other thing that's important is a quality of work. I don't like seeing people's portfolio sites that are just like everything they ever drew, you know, since they got a tablet. That's pretty bad. Shouldn't do that. <laughs> uh, I hate Flash, too. Like a, a Steve Jobs was right, man. Flash. Dead platform. No, nobody should be. I, 
I felt that way in 1999, man. Like in high school, I had a webmastering class, and I was like, okay, you guys are gonna use Clash. Like, no, what are we doing? It's so bad. I was like secretly working on HTML. No, that's not true. All right, so <laughs> getting in, these are some uh, keywords I like to think about when it comes to uh, getting yourself a, a job in the industry and just being successful uh, after you've got the job. Uh, they come up a lot in conversation with the uh, people I work with at Gearbox. And uh, once again, this is you know, just kind of my personal philosophy. So you got ambition, education, visibility, and assuming you're a content guy, like if you're a programmer, great portfolio isn't necessarily that important. Uh, I would say it's probably better if you have like some really good code samples on your website, or if you can just send somebody something that they can actually run on their machine, like a, a Mac script, or maybe even a game you made. If, if you're that talented, then hell yeah, do it. And uh, yeah, that interview isn't going too well. That's one of my favorite like stock images of an interview. <laughs> that lady's expression, she's just like, you're not getting it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ambition. <clears throat> So I've heard this described as passion, drive. I describe it as not being a lazy jerk face. Uh, I, I've had so many people that I've worked with at Gearbox, just them, they're like, it's so great that you're so passionate about you know, this project. And they, and they, they say that on every game that, that I've worked on, and I, I don't understand where that's coming from. I think when you get to that point, that's when you know you have ambition. It's like, I'm just doing what I want to do. <laughs> I, I'm not terribly concerned about you know what other people think about a particular feature. It's like, if I have an idea for it, I'm gonna work toward it, we'll see if it works. If it doesn't work, it's negotiable, you know, maybe we take it back. But the idea is that you, you just wanna try your best and, and always put your best report. You know, it, it, it's about being professional too. You can't just take everything face value and be like, okay, metal impact, let me copy this over from the last game we worked on or something like that. That's no good. Uh, another really big one that it's kind of sad that this falls off when when people get into the uh, the working world and whatever you want to call it. So stupid. What's the difference between a professional game developer and an amateur game developer? Does anybody know? Anyone want to venture a guess? A job? No. <laughs> That's bullshit. <laughs> There's no difference, and, 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 and I, hate, I hate to see anybody make the distinction. You guys are all game developers. Uh, that's something that, that my boss had told me when I first started, and the, the light kind of came on after he told that to me. It's like, I don't know if you guys noticed, uh, going to school here, the, the walls are just covered with all these like great projects that you guys have been working on. Uh, where I went to school, that was not the case. I, maybe five to ten percent of the student body actually had game projects that they were working on. And anytime I talked to somebody in the class, they would just look at me and be like, "Oh man, you're really ahead of the curve." I'm like, "No, this is what you got to do." Uh, that's another reason I think uh, the school is so great. Like, what you don't realize is before you uh, get the job, you, know, you can do whatever you want. Once you get into you know uh, an actual uh, career. You're not going to have as much time for your personal projects. It, it, it's kind of become really tough for you to convince yourself, I do need to spend time on this. You should. Uh, I, I feel like it's, it's just really, it's good for you because it helps you, you know, just sort of like flex that creative muscle. So don't forget that. It's easy to forget that because the paychecks start rolling in, but you will get burnt out, I promise. It happens. All right, education. Uh, <laughs> it's important. Why is everybody laughing? No. <laughs> uh, college is important. Obviously, you guys are here, so you know that part. Another thing is uh, workplace training. Uh, I don't think people realize that once you get a job, you, you don't stop learning. Uh, you're surrounded by uh, professionals. Some people that are going to be radically better at your little passes of whatever it is that you're working on, that you could learn stuff from them. But there's also uh, opportunities for you to learn cross-discipline. And uh, that's really important. And you should take advantage of that. Wherever you get a job, if they have any kind of class, they have any kind of lecture you know, that you can attend, you should show up to that stuff. It, it, it's all too often I see people, uh, especially when, once they're like 10 plus years into it, where they just get to the point where they're like, well, this isn't relevant to me, though. This is kind of the thing that I do. 
you don't know where you're going to be in five to ten years. The games industry is an extremely volatile place. So just don't get stuck and, and just be like, okay, this is the one thing that I do. And also, that's a that's a good place to go to school, right there. <laughs> All right. Uh, next one's visibility. Uh, people need to know you for what you do. Who's that guy? Ah, see, that's good. I'm impressed. I don't know how many of my coworkers would know who that is. <laughs> that being said, uh, who plays Minecraft? Very pretty, pretty people. Who's the creator of Minecraft? <laughs> uh, you know, while, while, while Notch is known for being the creator of Minecraft, uh, Minecraft was based off of a game called Infiniminer. You guys even heard of Infiniminer? Probably not. Oh, oh, two, three, four. Okay, four people. Good job. Everybody else, you have to leave. <laughs> uh, my, my, my point being that you guys know who this is, but you have no clue who Zachary Barth is because Zachary Barth didn't do as good of a job getting his name out there. And that's nothing against him. Like, a lot of that is circumstance. You know, when you come out of school, what happens to be going on with the news that day? Stuff that you might not necessarily be paying attention to. Point is that because Nash knew how to market himself, everybody knows Minecraft now. I mean, it, it sold like, what, 20 million copies of that game? Something ridiculous like that? Alright. Uh, number one mistake that I think is made by uh, a pro and student alike. Uh, I don't think this goes on too much here. I don't know, you guys have very well lit rooms, but I, I can see this potentially happening. There was, there was one guy sitting in the art room I saw, he was kinda, kinda off on his own, you know? Do, do not do this. Don't be, I don't know, that's not a guy or a girl. I don't know. The point is that <laughs> don't be that person. You don't wanna get caught sit, sitting at your computer on your own for days or weeks at a time working at the same personal projects or student projects that you should be working on. The reason for that is you never ask anybody for any feedback. Nobody can guide you. And it's so important that you know when you're making friends in the industry, when you're working with people in the academic world, that you have somebody come by and look at it. If you're anything like me, you know, and you guys aren't gonna believe this, I'm actually a really shy person. I just really like crowds. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it's all too easy to be, and I'm still guilty of this, like no joke, at work, you know, we've got like dual monitor set up, you've got kind of like a Cintiq over here, and I'll hear the, the door, right, and all of a sudden I'm like, I'm trying to make myself a little bigger, cover up the screen, or I'll minimize something, even though it's work related, just because I don't want, don't do that, that's the worst thing you can possibly do. You, you need to get feedback from people at all stages of what you're working on, regardless of, right? I mean, obviously, if like you're a programmer, no, you don't want to say, you know, hey, take a look at a half-finished uh, function that I wrote. That wouldn't make any sense. But that being said, it's really important that you're showing people what your work, you know, whether, whether it's art, a, a level, or, or what have you. All right. Uh, it's also important to be known without being annoying. Everybody knows this guy, I assume. I would be really shocked if you didn't, but uh, I couldn't tell you a single time like that I ever heard Miyamoto like give an interview that everybody remembered and everybody pointed to. He, he was just very much the guy that shows up at E3 with a shield and a sword, and it's like new Zelda game, and then runs off, and that's <laughs> like that should. <laughs> that should be the only thing that you ever have to do. You, you, you need to let your, your content speak for you, the games that you're making. Don't don't make a point to, you know, like, when you have to ask questions of people anytime you have an industry guest or whatever, uh, try and, like, dominate the thing and be like, okay, well, I'm going to get this great rep going with this dude. I've got, I've got, like, four questions for him that I, I heavily research. Like, nobody cares. So don't, don't do that. All right. All uh, right. I asked you guys this question a little bit earlier, and uh, I cannot stress the importance of this enough. Going to PAX, going to PAX East. PAX East is probably a little bit more viable for you guys around here. You need to go. These are the biggest video game conventions in the United States. Uh, PAX and PAX East have over 70,000 attendees for each show every year. It's crazy. You're going to be shoulder to shoulder with complete strangers. 
it can start to smell bad in there a little bit, okay. But they have like an indie booth crawl now, and that thing is ridiculous, man. I, they had uh, the Payday 2 developers in there. Did anybody play Payday 2? It was freaking great. That's all I'm playing right now. <laughs> that and Super Metroid. But the point <laughs> is, uh, uh, anytime you, you see a game that's pretty interesting, uh, Hotline Miami, for example. Anybody play that one at all? Check that out. Heard of that? Yeah. You know, it was made by two guys, really? It's ridiculous. I met one of them. The guy had, like, he's like a surfer, man. It was weird. He, he had a Ninja Turtle shirt on, and I'm just like, he's like, friendliest guy. I'm like, man, I, I love Hot on my so much. And he knows, like, Gearbox stuff. And he's like, you work in Gearbox? I was like, yeah. He's like, I love Borderlands, too. And I'm like, that's ridiculous, man. I don't, I don't, I, I didn't even know how to respond to that. I'm like, you made Hotline Miami. I'm like, who cares about Borderlands 2 right now? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so the, the point is that, like, just getting a business card from somebody at these shows is huge because maybe you never follow up with them, but if you do, if you do kind of email back and forth a little bit, at the very least you might get like a free game or something out of it. And if you're really lucky and you actually happen to, you know, start becoming friends with this person, you know, down the line, all the way all these companies shift and stuff, they, th there might be a job lined up for you when, when you really need it. And, and, and not just out of school, but when, when things take a turn for the worse. Uh, GDC, I probably shouldn't put up there because I haven't been, so that's messed up. Uh, uh, E3's really cool, though. Uh, it, it, I feel like in the late 90s, it, it was a lot more like exciting to, to me as like a teenager. I was like, yeah, man, it's going to be awesome. It's like, Duke Nukem Forever's coming out in 2000, man. It's going to be so cool. <laughs> and uh, I, I had a chance to go while I was at uh, Game Bunker in 2005, but like I didn't have the money, so I, I didn't end up making the, the trip out there. It always kind of killed me because either 2005 was a pretty uh, pretty cool show. Uh, that being said, uh, the only thing I would say uh, about E3 is it's a much more business-oriented convention. Uh, and so that being said, like if you're looking to just kind of like build your network, you know, like it, it, it's better probably for someone that's on the production track, someone that, that's looking into business development, something like that. Uh, for an artist or a level designer, you're, you're not going to get a lot of opportunities to talk to other developers there. They're, they're going to be there, but they're usually running a, a demo. Uh, other stuff, polycount. Who's on polycount? Artists. Okay. That's like a fifth of you. The other, <laughs> the other four fifths need to fix that. I, I know more people that got hired because of a post they made on uh, Polycount that work at Gearbox than because of somebody that they knew in the industry. All of the professionals pay attention to that forum. Excellent resource uh, for artists. Also recommend CG Hub, CG Society, and uh, if you're not a member of the IGDA, probably should be because they're in, uh, in communication with a lot of important people. And I just like to read Gaunt Suture for news. Pretty cool, good news site. A little bit less biased than your average uh, gaming blog. All right, so now I want to talk about a uh, portfolio, and I apologize in advance if this skews too heavily toward artists, since that's the world I come from. But uh, I think it's important that you don't leave unanswered questions. And uh, what I mean by that is, if you the best way to put it. There's so many times where someone will apply and well, we'll, we'll use the Borderlands example because that, that happens all the time. Where it's like someone's a big fan of Borderlands, they're like, I know what I'll do. I'm going to make this portfolio of all Borderlands assets. So they go through, they, they do the inking on all the corners of the texture and stuff. You know, they put little scratches in there, and that stuff looks really cool. Uh, if we get that uh, in and that's all we ever see out of you, then we're just kind of concerned that you don't have any range and you, you, you don't want to ever give off that impression. Don't, even if you make the best like sci-fi hallways ever and you know, you, you, you're staring at like Halo games and stuff all day and you just got the, the best word like, please like don't be afraid to put in a tree. A tree would be cool. Uh, <laughs> And, and I mean, yeah, obviously, if it's like a really terrible tree, like don't show us a bad tree, but you know, if you can do an okay tree, we want we want to see that. Uh, it's also important to show only your best work. Don't like make that tree 
and then three years later, when you're looking for another job, still have that tree on your portfolio. What is with that? I know it's not you guys specifically that are doing this yet, but this like that happens all the time. Uh, something that would really shock you in this regard that I'm, I'm sure you guys haven't run into before. Uh, you know, there's really not that many game companies out in the world, and so when they have an art test or like a level design test, and you worked really hard toward it, and then you apply, you know, like to Gearbox, and the artists see it, and they know what that test is for that other company, that's not good. That's like almost an immediate red flag where you're just like, oh, well, this was my test for them. I'll kick this over to you. Uh, it, it tells us too much. It tells us where you know you're trying to work to that we're not. We might not necessarily be your first choice if you already took care of that test. So don't don't use an art test from a different company and, and take it somewhere else. That's not good. Uh, once again, do not show your first attempt of anything. Please, every time people put in like the first 3D model they ever made with a cute little capture, I'm like, this is where it all began. I, I don't care. Don't show me that. <laughs> that is so crucially important, and people do not understand. They, they, they want to show a progression of how they've improved. It doesn't matter. We, we only care about the here and now and your potential in the future. Uh, the past is behind us, man. Uh, and show it to people that can coach you. That Once again, that's classmates and anybody that you know in the professional space. You go to the trade shows, you talk to people like me, and... I'm going to say this like five times until I beat it into everybody's head, but seriously, like after I give you guys my business card on your way out of here today, don't be afraid to email me. I answer all my emails. I'm perfectly happy to give you feedback, and if I don't have time to do it, or I don't think I'm the right person to do so, I will forward it to somebody that will do a better job. I, I am more than happy to be there for you. All right, so we're going to switch gears a little bit. You know, you, you've been taking those art tests. You've only been sending them to the companies that asked for them. They called you on the phone. They said, hey, would you like a job? <laughs> and you said, yeah, motherfucker, I will take a job. <laughs> I will want to work at your company. <laughs> and uh, you got it. You make a job. You know, that's cool. You're super excited. It's, I, I assume for most of you, this is all you wanted your entire life. That's how I felt. That's how I still feel, as you can probably tell. Here's the reality. That's a knife fight. <laughs> uh, you're surrounded by creative people now. You know, which granted, you are you already were in school, but you know, like, like we pointed out, and now they're being paid to do this, and they're afraid that one day they might not be. Uh, unfortunately, every feature that you're working on for uh, whatever project you might be on, every little tiny element of that has an owner. Somebody cares about that feature. And you you might go in there thinking, it's like, just like, oh man, up in the tea table, it's gonna be great, gonna make the best game, nobody's gonna stop me. But there's, you're at odds with egos that, that are coming at you from all directions. And that's, uh, it's tough. <laughs> You, you, you need to keep in mind that you're going to have a lot of these people that care about what they're doing too, and unfortunately, they're not always going to agree with you. All right. All right. So, uh, reality of work situation, there's going to be times where the deadline's looming. You've got till like Friday to, to finish something. It's Wednesday night. You're already staying late. But you really believe that this is something that you got to finish to make this game better. Um, you you might have people come to your desk and tell you, "Look, this feature needs to die," and you might not want to hear that right then. But the thing is, like, if you're already overexerting yourself, it's probably not worth it. The 48 hours to go, unless you just really feel that strongly about it. So. It's going to be up to you to make those judgment calls. You're going to, your leads are going to look out for you. Uh, my leads are always telling me, they're like, Nick, go home. What are you doing, Nick? Nobody cares. <laughs> Nobody can even see that pixel, man. <laughs> uh, I, I, I used to get in trouble all the time on, uh, on Borderlands 1 uh, with, with my boss, uh, Jim, where 
I would be staring at, uh, you know, like Skagzilla from Borderlands 1. It had this like giant beam attack. And I would just sit there and you know, space bar and UDK like replays your particle effect. And I'm just like, constantly. And I wouldn't even realize I was doing it because I was so obsessed with making it look right. And I, I would just eventually have Jim come in and be like, hey, you need to stop. <laughs> and, 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 so, I mean, it, it's important, too, when you're young to have people to kind of, like, make sure that they keep you in line. Because especially early on, when, when you're on an exciting project like that, it's super simple to get, like, lost in it. And you don't want to do that. And also, just don't try to pump stuff into the game that doesn't need to be there. Uh, another angle on this, you know, you, you need to understand that there's going to be people that you work with that think that that stupid thing that you're staying up for is worse than a, a waste of time uh, just because of what it is, but you're a talented person and they want you to work on something else. Uh, there's going to be times in a meeting where you bring up this idea and they say, no, let's not do that. Maybe they have the ability to override you, maybe they don't, but if you're the only guy in the room that thinks something's cool out of a group of 30 other professionals, it's probably time to consider that it might not be the best thing for the game. Listen to these people, hear them out. Uh, yeah, and you, you also want to be sure to drive action uh, within the confines of reason. This is something that I think a lot of people struggle with. Uh, at, at least the way that, that we work. At, at Gearbox, so you, you have a task management system. There's a bunch of different things that you need to, to look at and complete. Like I was telling you earlier, I've usually got a list of like 20 things that I need to make. And uh, the thing is, you, you as a creative person, you know that those 20 things do not make a game in the end. You, you can't just say, I'm going to complete everything on that list, be done, and this thing's going to go sell 20 million copies. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, it's important that you're using critical thinking skills. If you look at this and you're like, in a future where I have all this stuff done, what else am I going to want? Or, or at least, what else is the game going to need? Uh, you need to figure that out and figure it out soon. Uh, it, it, it's really hard early on to figure that out because your your perspective will be very narrow uh, as you start uh, until people start giving you more and more responsibility. But I feel like, especially as you get to the two, three year mark. It becomes really important that you pay attention to just the development cycle, uh, what's going on, and what you can offer to that process. And I, I know plenty of talented people that don't want to stand up in a meeting and say, "Look, I know it's cool that we're working on this, it's like, but you, you guys aren't even thinking about uh, this other thing over here." No, nobody wants to rock the boat. It's scary. They're they're afraid that their job's going to be on the line. Uh, in my personal experience, it just makes you a hero. You, you should always be putting your best foot forward that way. Uh, this is also important. You're now under scrutiny from everyone. This is particularly important when you're new. Uh, as soon as you walk in the door, everybody, I look like, okay, perfect example. Today, everybody that came in the room here, you guys have never seen me before. You know right away there's a stranger in your midst, right? And maybe you saw a picture of me prior to coming in here, maybe you didn't. But the point is that you know right away, it's like, okay, well this guy's new. Same thing in the professional space. When you walking in to the room, I, I mean, to tell a, a personal story again, I, I sat down to have lunch on my own in the break room. I didn't know anybody. I wasn't feeling particularly social at this point in time. And uh, a concept artist just sat down and started talking to me and being like, hey, what's up? What's your name? What do you do? And uh, I was terrified that everything I was going to say wasn't going to be good enough. And uh, I think that's good. Fear as a motivator is pretty strong. <laughs> you, 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 you don't want to be afraid all the time, but you, you want to care what these people think. That's super important. And, and not just because you're like you're trying to brown nose people or anything like that. You don't you don't want to do that because that's just never very attractive. But what, what you do want to do is make sure that these people, even though they don't know you, they're about to. You can tell them, this is what I'm working on. Uh, a month from now, I think I'm going to be working on this. Uh, and kind of what your long-term goals are, too. Like, may maybe you start off doing uh, 3D animation, but you, you decide that maybe you'd rather be the producer for the animation team. 
you just gotta figure those things out and make sure that people know that you're contributing something. Don't don't hide in the corner. So yeah, once again, that's really important. Uh, that, that that's important for the long term as well. Like your career trajectory is completely your own creation, regardless of what people constantly do, where they're blaming other people, circumstances surrounding anything going on with the company, uh, what happens with the individual game. Uh, the next game you put out could be a terrible flop, everybody could be fired. If that happens, and you weren't pulling your weight on that project, uh, you're gonna find there's usually like two to three other companies when a company shuts down that everybody goes to. Now, the people that you sat next to, if they know who you are, they had a good time working with you and they know that you do good work, they're gonna recommend you in a heartbeat because they would love to keep some of that familiarity with people that they've worked with in the past. Uh, on the other hand, if you sat there and you were just like, bro, I don't get paid enough. I'm messed up. I'm, put, I'm putting in like 35 hours a week here. <laughs> you know, like, unfortunately, that's something that gets into people's heads. They, they, they forget that this, this is such a, we are so privileged to even have these opportunities, you know, that in, in our society to take something that we all like, messed around with as kids and thought it was so so much fun. And I, I don't know what your guys' personal experience was with that, but uh, my dad was driving me around when I was uh, 13, I think when we were uh, coming back from, from school. And he's just like, son, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I was like, I'm gonna make video games, dad, it's gonna be great. And, and he's like, you know, you might as well tell him, oh, I'm gonna be a rock star. I'm, I'm going to be the most famous clown in the circus, you know, like, <laughs> that's not an answer that someone that was born in the 50s wants to hear. And my dad, for his part, was very understanding, and he's like, okay, he's like, uh, what kind of games do you want to make? And in a move that was unsurprising to any of you, I said, I'm going to make Mega Man! <laughs> He said, uh, son, by, your, by the time you're old enough to make a Mega Man game, they're going to be on Mega Man 13. Of course he was wrong. They were on, like, Mega Man 36. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, it's just important to, to know that this is what you want to do. It's about that passion. Uh, I hope this doesn't get me in trouble with anybody, but don't get pigeonholed by sticking to the same types of tasks all year. This is something that I think people really get stuck on, where they're just like, they start fixing collision issues or something in a game, or maybe on every individual project that you work on, it's like, well, we want a destructible crate or barrel, because that never happens. And uh, when, when you're sitting there working on your nice red explosive barrel, if someone comes by and is like, dude, that's the best red explosive barrel I've ever seen, it might get to the point where the next two, three projects uh, come around, they're like, well, where's our barrel guy? And that, that happens to everybody in every discipline, regardless of whether they do uh, visual effects or, or whatever. Um, you guys want to know which guy I am? Yeah. I'm, I'm the gore guy. <laughs> but you see, and, 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 and that's the thing. Like, It's so important that if you're on one project and you do that, People can know you for and they can be like, man, okay, this guy does really good gore. That's awesome. But don't get to the point where if there's no gore to, to be done, nobody knows what to do with you. That, that's horrible. And, and if it, you also just shouldn't be the first name that comes up every time. Uh, it's also important to uh, solve problems. Don't just fix bugs. This is something that junior people really struggle with. Every time that you come into a job and there's, you know, like toward the end of a, a milestone or a project, you're gonna start getting a bunch of bugs, hundreds of bugs, all the bugs. Don't just start tearing through those and forget about the stuff that you actually have to do to make a better game. Sometimes those bugs might come from a, a tester that hasn't been in the meetings that you've been in. They don't know what the actual focus for the design team, for the artist, what all that stuff is. Uh, 
it's important to fix bugs, especially at the end. You're gonna need to do that. People don't like doing it, and they don't wanna get stuck fixing a bunch of them. It's like, but that being said, you have to strike a balance. Get your assignments done, <coughs> then focus on fixing bugs. I, I, I can't stress that enough. There's, there's too many people that either ignore bugs entirely, or as soon as they get them, they have no clue how to do the rest of their work without finishing it. Find the middle ground. So this slide is uh, kind of personal as well. Uh, this is up there because I get in trouble for this a lot. Uh, you want to put as much time in as you can to do a really good job and you know, once again, make sure people know you and see what you can do for an individual game or project or, or even just your department, whatever. Don't stay <laughs> to, to be like the latest person, you know, the last person out of the office. Don't make sure that you're putting in more hours than everybody else. Uh, it's not sustainable. Uh, when you're starting off, or, or maybe like in short bursts, you're just like, man, this is really important to me. I really want this to be awesome. Maybe it's right before vacation or something, and you want to make sure that you get to a good stopping point. That's different. But you know, don't don't go in there and just do like self-imposed crunch. That's just not good. And I, I think some of the, uh, the most focused game developers I've ever met, the, this is kind of their greatest vice. Especially me. Uh, so. Other common problems, this is uh, really just about stuff that, that happens in the workplace that you either need to avoid or you need to find better ways to deal with. Water cooler talk is rampant. It never goes away. Uh, I mean, I, I remember we had the same issue when I was in college. <laughs> Prior to Gearbox, I, I worked at uh, Walmart. That was really fun. Uh, same problem there. Uh, people talk about each other, and they're really cruel. People might, you know, kind of get uh, singled out. Uh, they'll say, oh, this guy uh, is the worst artist at the company. Don't do that. <laughs> why, why would you do that to anybody? That, that, that's not cool. And if you hear somebody else talking that poorly about someone, you know, like, maybe investigate the problem, see, see what's going on. Maybe there's some other disconnect there, but don't be just one more voice that's like, oh yeah, such and so sucks. Yeah, that's unhealthy. It brings team morale down, and you would be shocked how much that happens. And to me, the games industry is such a happy place. <laughs> and it's really horrible when you hear people that just hate each other for no good reason. And it, it, it could be the most petty exchange that they've ever had. And uh, the worst ones, the worst ones are rooted in the work that you're doing. That's why I had the knife fight image earlier. Like, you you would be amazed the stuff that comes up in uh, just your task tracking system, uh, emails that go company wide, where someone has an idea and they're like, okay, this is what I want to do, and the very first reply within three minutes is, that sucks and you're stupid. We, we have very open work environments in the video game industry. Uh, Gearbox especially. Everybody's allowed to say whatever they want. I can go march right up to Randy Fishburne's office at any point and say, I don't, I don't like what's going on. Uh, to, to say we have a, an open door policy is really undercutting the fact that we can talk to anybody. Project leads, whatever, and throw your ideas out there. Uh, as soon as people stop talking to each other, that's how those rivalries get formed. Uh, I want to reiterate also, people are afraid to take the initiative sometimes. Just because nobody told you, you know, to, to work on, you know, the dust for the vehicles in Borderlands 2 or something, they're just like, oh, it's fine, you know, that task got resolved, nobody needs to look at that anymore. If you know you can improve it, why not do it? No one is going to get mad at you for that. As long as it's within the confines of what's reasonable to the project, as long as it's not feature creep, as long as you're not causing, uh, or not creating more work for somebody in another discipline, everyone's just going to love you for it. So that's, that's really important as well. 
Ah. Content pipeline bottlenecks. Uh, this is something that we run into <coughs> constantly. I don't think this is avoidable, at, at least on first-person shooters. Um, until a character model is done, an animator can't rig the thing. Until the animator has put some animations in, any of the effects I make are guesswork. And the sound effects are being made for something that nobody can see. There are going to be points in time where people are doing their work and maybe, maybe somebody quits. Maybe a whole bunch of people quit. Who knows? As soon as there, there's one little link in the chain that's slowing everybody else down, the only thing that you can do to compensate for that is look at your own work schedule and make sure that you're not putting yourself into a trap where you're finishing all the stuff that it's like, oh, I can, I can work on this right now. It's like we've already got animations for that. You, you want to find some opportunities to, to work on things when you're waiting on somebody else to finish their work. You should always have like five things lined up where you're like, well, I can do this. Because any time that you spend just kind of like sitting at your desk, it, it, it doesn't make you look good, and it's not for the benefit of the project. Something else is, uh, you know, programmers have to do so much in this industry. They're, they're expected to make all the gameplay code work, but then anytime something's wrong with the tools, it's usually an artist or a producer beating on the door saying, hey, when are we going to fix this? If, if you would fix this, we could do our work 10 times faster. Trying to strike that balance is really difficult. If you're on the art side, you do need to be vocal about the help that you need. Uh, code support, uh, particularly to my job, is crucially important. Uh, there's always tools improvements that we're working on. The, the Gearbox editor, as it stands, is radically different from base uh, UDK. Uh, and uh, so much of that is just making sure that it caters to the type of game that you're going to make. And <clears throat> you're going to find that the fewer hoops you have to jump through, the, the better job you're going to do. Unfortunately, on the other side of things, the programmers have so many things to do, and you shouldn't interrupt them. <laughs> so you have to be very careful of that. Be aware that they've got work to complete, too. Uh, and especially if it's someone that's pulling double duty as like an AI programmer and a tools guy. Keep that stuff in mind. We're all human beings. Uh, and then uh, finally, I'll say uh, contractual obligations and uh, your tasks. Sometimes what's laid out in the contract for a game is the bare minimum. Uh, kind of like I was saying earlier, you, you need to make sure that when you have a roadmap, you know, producer, uh, <laughs> and you're looking at this whole thing and you can kind of see from the beginning to the end that you're showing it to all the different stakeholders. You're showing it to the artists. You're showing it to the animators. Let them take, uh, take a look at it. And they'll throw the suggestions at you right away. Where it's like, well, you're not tracking this. You know, a, a great example would be if you're doing a bunch of different guns and you create a list of tasks where it's like, well, we need to model the gun, we're rigging the gun, and we're going to make some effects for the muzzle flashes and the tracers. And it's like, okay, so yeah, that's everything that we need for the gun. And it's like, no, no, that's not right. When, when you want to start, like, ejecting shells and then you go over somebody and it's like, oh, well, we don't have a model for a unique shell for that gun. And that wasn't on the list. Nobody brought it up. That's what really starts to put you behind. You, you have to pay attention to that stuff. And don't be afraid to speak up. No one is going to freak out. If you suggest that there might be more work here than we actually thought, people are usually going to be grateful. They might not be happy that they have to do the work, but it's going to happen anyway. And it's better sooner than later. All right, I'll get into some of my, my general industry musings here. Uh, the volatility of your job situation. Uh, I've been really fortunate. You know, I, I told you guys I started at Gearbox in uh, 2008. Obviously, it's 2014 now. I've been in the same place. They've been taking really good care of me. That is not the experience for a lot of people. Uh, sometimes you, you can start at a, a, an indie developer a uh, small startup, uh, and they might pay you a lot out of the gate, and it might not necessarily be money that they have. On the flip side of things, you might go work at a AAA studio on an MMO where they just, you know, put out a press release, we're about to hire 500 people, and, you know, they will. 
And when the game's done, they're going to fire 400 of them. That's just the way this goes sometimes. You need to be aware before you take a job anywhere. What, what's that company like, really? And uh, where are they going to be in a few years? Uh, does their success hinge on this one game, or can they take a hit? All right. So crunch, that's another thing. I, I gotta say, I, I have really not had a whole lot of experiences with, uh, with crunch so far. Uh, a lot of my friends that have worked in uh, mobile game development and stuff like that uh, would be in constant crunch that usually ended with shipping a game that didn't sell, and then they all got hired. Uh, I don't think that crunch is something that anybody should assume going into a job. Uh, be open, uh, especially in phone interviews. Uh, same story when you, if you get an in-person interview. Just pull people to the side. Be like, hey, what's it really like to work here? How, how many hours should I really expect to spend? Like, maybe you just got married, you're expecting a kid. Uh, maybe you live on your own and you just really, really want to play some more Minecraft. I don't know. So the point is, don't just assume that you have to sign your life away for one of these it's like. Maybe it's what you want to do, May, but it's probably not. Well, most people don't want to be uh, stuck in their desk for, for that long every week. Uh, something I wanted to ask you guys, uh, what are some of your ideal jobs? What are some of the companies you want to work for? Just email them out. Buy games. Mm. Creative assembly. Creative assembly. Good. Yeah. <coughs> Alice. 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 Irrational games. <coughs> That's interesting. Yeah, so. It's a, it's a good list. I like, I like your guys' choices. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear there's quite the connection. Uh, yeah, and that's the, you, you need to take advantage of that too. I mean, just the, based on proximity, it's like, yeah, I, I would say EA Sports is, a, is an obvious choice for you guys around here. Definitely. I'm going to get into Florida versus Texas in a little bit. Uh, so, uh, for me, coming into uh, the industry and Prior to school, I think my ideal jobs were like Blizzard, uh, Nintendo, and maybe like Valve, something like that. Uh, now, I don't want to work any of those places. <laughs> uh, the thing that I think is important uh, for everybody to know is don't choose those companies based on the games that you enjoy. I, I think that's a really common mistake. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, if you're really into, say, League of Legends, and you decide you want to work at Riot Games, that's going to change the way that you enjoy that product. You're, you're not going to have as much fun playing it just by virtue of working on it all the time. But the other thing is, you got to know what that company culture is. You got to do the research. And uh, I think sometimes people are too dependent on the interview to get that information. Don't do that. Yeah, you, you need to just. Add people on LinkedIn, go to Facebook. If you can uh, find an event, once again, like the PAX shows where you can hang out with some of these guys and talk to them about what's going on with them. Yeah, yeah I mean, even if it's just like over like a drink or something for just like a few minutes, you can find out so much about a company that, you know, maybe it's really exciting to you and maybe it's not. The, the, the key is just be sure that you know what you're actually getting yourself into. Don't, don't romanticize it to the point where you're just like, I love Half-Life. So I'm going to Valve. I love Borderlands, so I'm going to Gearbox. Keep that stuff in mind. Tighten up the graphics on level three. <laughs> Everyone is familiar with this, yes? That awful commercial. God, I hate that thing. So bad. This is something that like I remember seeing while I was in school, and then when I started working at Gearbox, I, I just assumed that nobody had any clue what that was. I still hear people say that all the time, <laughs> and like it's funny, but I don't like where it came from. As it, it comes from a a stance of uh, of ignorance, and unfortunately, we have a lot of people in in, in our daily. How, how many of you guys really think that the best way where your, your, your family members do? Do they understand what you guys are doing here? Do they have any clue? I don't see a lot of head shaking. Yeah. That doesn't stop. I, I, I have 
my, my sister got married in December. So we saw a bunch of old family friends hadn't seen for a long time. And every conversation went basically the same way every time. People kind of approach, they say, hey, uh, I hear you're doing really well. What are you doing? And you proceed to try to explain to them, it's like, oh, I make video games, and they're like, that's so cool. Yeah, like, I, that makes sense, because you used to play them all the time. <laughs> awesome. And it's like, well, I don't play them all day. I, like, to be perfectly honest with you guys, I, I play fewer games now than I ever have in, in my entire life. Absolutely. Uh, there's something about sitting at a computer for that long every day that when you go home, the last thing you want to do is then go load up Steam at home, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's something to keep in mind. Uh, difference between amateur and pro, I already beat you guys over the head with that. I think I scared you a bit. Um, and yeah, so they pay you to play games all day. That's terrible. I think it's really important that people respect quality assurance teams and testers, because they actually do that. And you guys know that it's not fun to play something that's broken. <sighs> OK. Uh, Family doesn't understand what you do. We kind of talked about that a bit already. Work-life balance issues. Do, do not let that happen to you. I, I have had an end-of-year evaluation before where my boss, the same one that told me I need to stop, asked me, what, he's like, what do you think you need to do to, to further yourself in this company? And that's when I came up with the word visibility. And uh, right when I was having that conversation with him, he decided to say, he's, he's like, Nick, I'm worried about your... Uh, your ability to maintain personal relationships while you're working here. That's not a good thing to hear in an end of year evaluation. You're going to want to make sure that you don't forget about your family, don't forget about your friends, no matter how much you love your job, and I love my job. Uh, importance of quality assurance teams mentioned that as well. Testers are important. They don't get a lot of respect. Please respect what they do. Half the time, they don't get paid very much. They might not be in a very permanent employment situation, but they play the game all day, so you don't have to. Uh, AAA versus indie, what's right for you? Uh, most of you guys listed AAA developers when I asked you where you wanted to work. Uh, keep in mind that for the independent developers are out there too. Uh, it's very easy to think that you're going to have like all this creative freedom no matter where you go, and that's not necessarily true. Once again, it's about knowing company culture and what you're getting yourself into. Like, I, I would love to work with the Hotline Miami guys. In fact, since you guys are recording this, call me. No, <laughs> but, uh, you know, like, just keep in mind people that you think would actually be cool to work with. Not because you're actually looking for a job, but because you, you want to be in contact with these people down the line. That's, that's super important. Uh, and, and same story with the mobile games. When, when, when there's a, a huge like a, a mobile uh, like MMO or a MOBA, something like that, that's got a huge development team on staff. And uh, Capcom just this week said they, they were going to hire, I think, 500 developers over the next five years or something crazy like that. That's really exciting and expensive. So be aware of what that means for that company and, and their financial situation. Do the research. Uh, buzzwords suck. Please, please do not be the guy in the meeting that's talking about free cycles, synergy, low-hanging fruit. I hate that. That's the worst. Don't do that. Anytime you do that, everyone makes fun of you as soon as that meeting gets up. It's not good. Uh, respect that innovation comes in many forms. I mentioned the Minecraft thing earlier about Zachary Barth and Infiniminer. Portal. Portal's a great original Valve game, right? No. You guys know that one. All right, that's good. Or you all looked it up on your phones. I don't know. There's a lot of screens out there. One of the two. But yeah, what was the original name for the student game? Awesome. Man, you guys are impressive. I, uh, man, kind, of, kind of taking them back here. That's nice. All right, so cool. Uh, yeah, so hey, you know that, that, that was... Uh, from another school. Uh, <laughs> talking specifics now, I want to look at some of the game studios that are in Florida, some of the game studios that are in Texas. <laughs> these are some of the places that are in Florida. Some of these are closer than others. EA Sports right in the middle there. 
represent, you know, whatever. Uh, I, I don't know what half of these companies do. I hope you guys do because you're local. If you don't, look them up because I, I don't know. Are, are most of you guys from the area or, or, or you know, all from kind of different areas of the country? Here's like half and half. Half and yeah. half. So, some companies there. This is Texas back in the day. Look at all the studios, man. Yeah, yeah. God Games, Gathering of Developers, Ensemble, bringing you a bunch of real time strategy games. Apogee, bringing you like Duke Nukem 1 and 2, Iguana did NBA Jam. It's software, man. It's like Doom, Quake. Rage, I guess. Pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, now, there's something that, you know, mo most of these companies, uh, they're, they're not really around anymore, you know? We still have id. Uh, ensemble kind of reformed into a new Microsoft Game Studios uh, in a different location. Uh, Apogee is better known as 3D Realms, and uh, they shut their doors in 2009, uh, right while I was wrapping up uh, Borderlands. Sad state of affairs. Gathering of developers, they don't exist. Uh, I'm not sure who's making NBA Jam right now, but it's not a Guanax thing. Uh, Texas has the second largest concentration of game development studios in the country, and they are right behind California. One of the things that I like about Texas versus California is the cost of living. A studio apartment in California can run you like $2,500 a month or something ridiculous like that. That's insane. I'm from a town called Plano, Texas. You might also recognize that as the home of Gearbox Software. I am the luckiest dude ever that the town I was born in also has the awesome game development studio that I work in. I was terrified of going to California. I don't want to go to California. Let's not go to California. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of awesome game development studios there. You see, uh, you know, these are the ones that are actually in, uh, in Austin. Uh, Armature, really cool. I don't know if you guys heard, they had a Mega Man X game they were working on that got canceled. It's sad. I, I, I thought that was pretty exciting. We, we hired a guy from, from Armature at one point, and I was like, did you get him play it? He's like, no, I didn't touch it at all. Now I don't like him anymore. Uh, <laughs> Bioware's got a studio in Austin as well. Retro, you guys know them for uh, Donkey Kong Country lately, and prior to that, Metroid Prime, really popular as well. Twisted Pixel, all that good stuff. This is the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex now. Uh, some of the, the studios we have feeling on here. Uh, Barking Lizards was founded by Sandy Peterson. He was one of the uh, original names that kind of founded it, and he's split off, done his own thing now. He's mostly doing uh, tabletop stuff uh, from, from a Kickstarter that he had. Nerve, they do a lot of like Call of Duty map packs, and uh, we work with them every now and then. Robot does Orcha Must Die. Bottle Rocket, they do a couple of mobile games, and the biggest thing that I know that they've done is uh, they do a lot of apps too. So they, they do like the WWE app, and then Game Circus, I don't know what they do. Uh, the major DFW area devs, there are two. Gearbox on the left, and id, and id is of course owned by Zenimax now. Uh, which is also the parent company that owns Bethesda. I heard someone throw out the name Bethesda there before. That's kind of scary for someone like me that, that's growing up, you know, in this area. Uh, we, we have a really large game program at, at the school I came from, uh, UT Dallas. And uh, I, I think they have, have a couple thousand students registered in that program at any given time. And it's like Gearbox has maybe 200 full-time employees, something like that. Uh, I'm not sure about it. I'm pretty sure it's even fewer. Uh, you, you see where this competition comes in for trying to get a spot somewhere. Right. This is why I like Gearbox. You guys asked me earlier if, if you could see me in a picture. This is a nice big screen. I can find myself pretty easily. That's me. <laughs> I, I had facial hair. It was really scraggly and pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of late nights. Um, so, uh, I like your watch because of the people. I like our intellectual property. You know, we got Borderlands. We own Duke Nukem now. 
uh, just recently picked up Homeworld, so uh, that's cool. And uh, of course, Brothers in Arms is how Gearbox made its name in the first place. Um, I like our brand strength and recognition. When I come in here, you guys know who Gearbox Software is. You know what we make. And also, they pay me money and stuff. So that's pretty cool. I like so. money. Uh, <laughs> Uh, other reasons I like Gearbox, the flexible hours, you can really work whenever you want. That's been the experience that I've heard from a lot of people at a lot of different game companies. We have a profit sharing and royalty program, so that means in addition to your base salary, if a game does really well, you will get money from it, and that's pretty exciting. Uh, also, creative freedom. I don't know how into Borderlands 2 you guys ever really got, but I put a lot of stupid crap in there that nobody told me to. <laughs> they scan those little uh, envelopes, little QR codes, says like Nick Wilson, ho oh yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what else did I do here? Oh yeah, there's, a, there's like a side quest where you have to shoot uh, rack poop off of like fans in the first Borderlands. They, they were like, we're going to cut this, and I was like, no dude, I will make the poop. <laughs> you, can, you can do pretty much whatever you want. It's pretty awesome. Uh, and you should apply. I just wanted to throw that out there. You know, not knocking anybody else, but Gearbox is cool. And I came from there. And you know somebody from there. It's me. <laughs> Alright, so now I want to kind of get into a couple stories. Uh, some stuff that happened to me. I'll run through that really quickly. I want to try and give you guys some time to ask me some questions, too. Uh, applying for and getting the job. Uh, this was kind of weird. Uh, we had grandparents coming from out of town. I'm sitting around my parents' house doing laundry. I had about three months left until I graduated college, and I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to start doing cold applications to different places. I applied to two different studios. Gearbox and uh, Harmonix, which is out of Boston. They make the rock band games. I assume everybody plays those, or did. I don't know if anybody does anymore. Uh, I still have all those plastic instruments, so like, if you do too, don't feel ashamed. Um, I got a call back in 30 minutes. That does not happen. Uh, it just so happened that I am the luckiest person on the face of the earth, and uh, one of the producers uh, at Gearbox had actually just decided, hey, we need an art intern. So he came in and uh, handed his note to HR. And right afterward, my email came in and said, I'm looking for a job. I'm graduating soon. And uh, so I get this call. They said, hey, is it cool if the producer calls you? The guy's name was uh, Charlie. I'm like, sure. Charlie calls me the next day. He's like, hey, we want you to bring in uh, art outsourcing content for our games. He's like, you'll be doing that in Unreal Engine 3. You know how to do that stuff? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, so you want the job? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> that was it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. It's crazy. Uh, something else. Um, are you guys familiar with the Hyperion moon base in Borderlands 2? The giant thing in the sky pictured there behind that loader robot? How, how did the loader robot scale on the planet? The giant, yeah. I did that. That took a long time. Uh, something that you run into all the time, and I've kind of poked at a little bit in this presentation, is something flickering. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, you'll have opinions from from different designers and, and and what have you about how something should look, and sometimes you can't come to a consensus, and you, you need to try a different strategy. Uh, the moonshot as we call that thing, from the Hyperion moon base, went through 12 different iterations and eight different artists before it arrived at where it is now. It just so happened that I was the last artist on the team that they gave it to, and I, I was able to make something that our lead designer was happy with. Uh, moral of the story is, if you're getting really frustrated by a task, don't be afraid to trade with people. Maybe that's not the thing that you need to be working on. Talk to people that are in your discipline a little bit, and do what's best for the game. You don't necessarily have to take this stuff and, and knock it out of the park every time. Uh, for, for our team, it was just like, man, 
no one's happy with this thing. Can you please get it to a point where we, we can stop thinking about it? And uh, eventually I was able to do that. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, all right, this one's really weird. So uh, Duke Nukem Forever. I had a lot of fun working on that game. It, it's really bizarre to be able to say that the game that I was looking forward to in 2000 as a teenager is a game that I'm like, I'm like the 12th person listed in the credits or something like that. I, I got to spend a lot of time working on it. It was, it was really important to me. As soon as I, I found out that we like acquired the brand and stuff, I, I asked uh, one of our producers, I'm like, I'm like, what are the odds that I'm going to get to work on Duke Nukem forever? And they said, okay, I'm glad you asked that because zero uh, percent. And I'm like, oh, and I was all crushed. Well, thankfully they came to their senses later. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I, I ended up getting a technical artist uh, credit on the game. I, I, a lot of the particle effects that were in the game were actually uh, really, really old. Surprise! Um, this game uh, was in development for something like uh, 13 to 15 years, depending on when you consider the start date. And uh, so, toward the end, there, uh, there were these particles for a, a little, you know, like water machine. You got hot water, cold water. And uh, we're, we're about to ship, and all of a sudden the water starts coming out so slow, it starts looking like ice cream instead. And I'm like, man, this is weird. So, you know, if, if you guys worked with Cascade at all in Unreal 3, you familiar with that? Okay. In Duke, it's nothing like that. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you have a, a visual, like, editor that you you'd normally change stuff in for particle effects. And I'm like, okay, well, cool. Uh, I'll open this up and, and find the, the water effect. It wasn't in there. And I couldn't find it. And I was talking to some coders about it and trying to figure out where is this thing. And I'm looking at the file locations, and it's not in a content package. It's actually stored in script. Hmm. Now, why would it have been stored in script, you think? Uh, well, it was made prior to a graphical interface existing for editing particle effects. So you can imagine how thrilled I was. I was really excited about that. Uh, so thankfully I found that and I was like, okay, well I can fix this, cool, no problem. And uh, you know, there's just like velocity values, whatever, change some numbers, save it, check it in. And uh, I noticed something before I turn it in. So this is uh, March 2011 that this is going on. Every single one of these particle effects that had been made in the text file, because this was probably, I assume they weren't using you know, version control like you do today, uh, everyone put a copyright date and their name next to the effect. And this particular effect was made by a man named Charlie in March 2001. The guy that hired me at Gearbox had made this thing 10 years, almost to the day. I ended up calling them later and, and talking about it. It's just that should give you an idea of just how tiny this industry really is. The, the, this guy, who just so happened to, to want to hire me later, is like I worked on this, left the company to go to uh, Respawn, and then I find this bug. And I, I, I next time I met up with him, he's like, he's like Nick, you're in the habit of cleaning up my messes. So I just thought that was really. That's pretty much it for the rambling portion of this. I wanted to give you guys some time to ask some questions. I know I've been talking way too long. Uh, anything at all that you have for me that you want to ask, let me know. If you're shy, I'll make sure everybody gets business cards. Is there someone I can hand these to to get these like kind of passed out? There we go. Fish these out of here. <laughs>